joining today. This is the first in a series of unfiltered talks about intersectionality, quality, diversity, inclusion, all sorts of things. So really excited to be joined by Mitch, who is 18 years a senior lecturer in occupational therapy at London Southwark University, co-founder of the BAMOT UK, a group formed as a campaigning and activist group in relation to the Royal College of Occupational Therapists, um, which is a kind of an approach to recognizing and dealing with institutional racism. She's now also two days a week at her institution, uh, and she's a student success and anti-racist educational practitioner. So really, really excited to be speaking with you today, Mitch. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I'm really excited to be having this opportunity. I don't know if I'm going to stop talking. You'll have to stop me at some point. <laughs> no, you're okay. This is a, a good place to kind of keep keep the conversation going. So I'm really excited to be talking with you today. So we've got kind of a few kind of broad questions to kind of think about intersectionality, the history of it, when you kind of came into contact with it, what it means to you. But it would be great just to kind of hear a little bit more about yourself, maybe your experiences and a bit about your work and um, how you've kind of brought intersectionality to, to your space. Thank you, yes. I mean, I'm going to start off by saying that my full name is Mushrat Jabin Ahmed Landiyu, but I like being called Mish. Um, I'm a British Bangladeshi, and my family left Bangladesh just a few years before the War of Liberation from Pakistan, and Bangladesh was formed in 1971. Um, I mean, my parents left Bangladesh when I was a, a, a baby, um, and we went to Africa. We went to uh, the city called Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Um, I have formed many memories, actually, but I'm not sure if they're real or just, you know, formed <laughs> stories from my parents, but they're very vivid in my mind. Um, mm -hmm. Like the evening walks um, by the beach and, and, and drinking fresh coconut water out of the green coconuts. I remember that, that it's being too big and heavy and I couldn't even hold it. And and playing with children from every nationality where we wow. lived. Um, but then in the early 70s, moved to Britain, where I realised then that I was different and mm. sometimes dehu dehumanised uh, by people that were racialized as white. And this was straight off the bat as a little person, as a child. Mm. Um, and because of the racism and lack of career progression for my father, who's a specialist surgeon, um, we ended up leaving um, England and moving to the United Arab Emirates where we stayed till I was 18 years old. And I grew up in a very idyllic, oblivious, privileged life in the United Arab Emirates, completely um, kind of sheltered and hidden from reality, really. And then came back to England to study for uni studies and then made England my permanent home base. So work-wise, I am a senior lecturer mm. in occupational therapy. And like you said, two days a week, I'm a student success and anti-racist education practitioner. And that mouthful title means that I am looking and working towards and making sure that there is a positive and equitable learning experience for all, for all students. Um, and and that's very important to me. Um, and when did I first come in contact with intersectionality? I'm going to go on to yeah, that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, it, I mean, I think I, like I said, I became really conscious of it, mm. really cognizant of it when I went to primary school at the age of five. And I felt the okay. ripples of it before then. 
but I really felt the fact that I was female, I was brown skinned. At that point, I had quite a heavy accent because, you know, we just mm -hmm. come from Tanzania. Um, I spoke Swahili, don't anymore, <laughs> lost it. Um, and I mean, although I had the privilege that my dad was a doctor and earning, never felt that privilege, never felt it. Um, and I was from an early age code switching just to fit in, just to get along, also not to be noticed because there was so much bullying and harassment nearly every day in primary school. As I left school, someone would want to bash me verbally or physically. So it's a constant, you know, mm -hmm. and, and my peers and the teachers constantly pointed out my difference and othered me. And this was the 70s, early 70s. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it did affect my ability to attend to education in my early years. But also, um, I think my father was affected by it as well and found it hard to see his daughters experiencing this and also himself experiencing racism within the workplace the constant microaggressions you know because he's mm. short and he's brown and he didn't take tea in his mm. I mean he didn't take sorry, sugar in his tea <laughs> and well, he still talks about it because the pain is still there. Mm -hmm. So, and, and getting passed over uh, for promotions by younger doctors, racialized as white, and they kept dangling this promotion um, yeah. aspect, but never giving it to him, saying, stay, stay, but never giving it to him. So that's why I think we moved to the United Arab Emirates, where I had a different experience, where straight away they said to my father, your daughters are behind in their education. He knew that because my father had to keep moving around because he couldn't get a permanent contract and he was a locum, constantly yeah. looking for a permanent contract. But I caught up really quickly because the classes were smaller, the education ethos was different. It was about harnessing the strength that I had in my education and putting it everywhere in every aspect of the you know topics that I was learning and it was the equity in the internationalism as well it didn't matter in mm. those schools whether you were an Arab a national whether you were a foreign Arab whether you were an Asian whether you were black whether you were white it didn't matter you were a child in education mm. and they wanted you to do well they wanted yeah. you to profit from their service. Um, but what I do remember is that when we were in England and as that small child, I couldn't really speak to my parents because I could see they had their own struggles mm -hmm. and I sort of kept it to myself. And I think that's also effect that affected my education as well. Sure. But my shining light was my sister. She wouldn't take any crap from anybody she was like <laughs> she would fight with everybody you know and this okay. is a, you know she's six and a half years old and she's having mm -hmm. to fight teenagers and adults wow. you know i mean physically they would hurt us it wasn't just a verbal abuse so you know so she, she's like this and she's always strong and i always look after her because she was the person that kept me going otherwise to be Honest, I don't think I would have been successful in getting into my adulthood okay. if I had constantly had this. But there mm. were moments of light from this <laughs> mouthy, mouthy older sister, mouthy older sister. So, you know, the daily racism and the inter intersectionality of being female and brown and with an accent, it did affect my cognition. It did affect my emotions and it affected my communication skills i was very nervous to step outside the door even as a mm. little child yeah so that's a kind of picture of me sounds very negative but here i am alive yeah. and successful <laughs> and talking to you i think um, it's an incredible journey and i think like 
you talk about it's quite interesting that you talk about Doris Star. That's where my mum um, lived as well when she was much younger and went to school there. So it's that 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 story of migration, that story of movement across cultures, really resonates from from some of the things that she mentioned. She talked about the animals that she had as pets, the the different cultures, the friends she made. I was just wondering, thinking about like when you are when you are in in Dar es Salaam and when you are in the United Arab Emirates as well, and you talked about lots of different cultures, and it seemed like intersectionality did exist, but in a different way. Um, I just wondered if you could tell us more, a little bit, just a little bit more about the kinds of cultures that existed in those places, and maybe how you are at the time, and yeah, just to kind of learn a little bit more about that context. Yeah, I tell you, um, in Dar es Salaam, <clears throat> when I look at the pictures and stuff, it was like a United Nations campus. It was like so many different nationalities. And the children there, like my dad said, we all understood each other and spoke little bits of each other's language. So I could, by the time I was about five, I could speak a little bit of 13 languages, which was really wow. interesting. Uh, fluent Swahili, fluent Bangla, um, little bits of English. At the time, I didn't need English in Tanzania. Um, but we could speak each other's languages. Um, there wasn't this thing, it, it didn't come across to us at that point as, as little people that um, there was difference between us. Um, mm. Because where we were, like um, I remember Solomon, he was my nanny, he was my male nanny, and his kids used to come over, you know, and there wasn't any anything, there wasn't any hierarchy or anything. We just came over after school because Solomon was looking after us. And the 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 fact that um we were from different countries, there was a difference in um uh our, our economics mm. that didn't come into it there was a difference there was rules but there was this complete camaraderie that we belonged in that space that was yeah. the difference that i felt and in the united arab emirates there was a difference though because there is a hierarchy you can't yeah. get away from it in, in the United Arab Emirates. And the rules are very different. But where I was, in my little social microcosm, didn't feel it. Didn't yeah. feel it. Didn't touch me. That's and so interesting. Everybody was privileged. Everybody was privileged. Okay. Yeah. So in, in our circle... Um, if you went outside our circle, you really f saw the hierarchy and felt the hierarchy. Oh. In the circle that we, we were in, everyone came from the same base, from the same place, from the same struggles. Oh. So we we were all there from the same struggles and we landed in this place of privilege that was helping us. So um, there were people who came straight from Bangladesh. There were people that came... Um, uh, from England, like my yeah. parents, and from America, um, Australia, Thailand, you know, lots of different people. Yeah. And we were a community. We doesn't mean we didn't notice our differences in our yeah. ethnicities. Okay. But the, that, that was also what brought us together. Yeah. Because we had all these, we weren't nationals of the United yep. Arab Emirates. We were all coming in um, for, you know, economic migration, to get more mm -hmm. money, to have better life, et cetera, yep. et cetera. Um, but I would never go back there. Okay. <laughs> I would never go back there as an adult because my politics and my values and beliefs as an adult mm -hmm. don't match. So, um, if you don't mind me asking, how, how old were you when you were in um, UAE at that time? So, probably, I'm trying to calculate, probably I went there when I was starting what would be secondary school, if you're about 11. Okay. So, yeah. Maybe a bit younger, and then yeah. left at 18 to come to university. Right, okay. 
So just, um, just on Sansa, um, from Tanzania, you went to, you and your family went to, to England. Yeah. And then uh, after a short time, um, your family migrated to UAE. Yeah. And then you, you kind of came came back to the UK for, for university, is that right? Yes. Okay. So I understand, like, um, it's quite interesting kind of hearing about the multitude of cultures outside of the UK. And it sounds like also being in the UK is when you really notice that otherness, that difference, and the real adversities around difference um, as well. Um, and now that's, that's, that's obviously, you know, hugely personal. And, and you talked about how it kind of, you know, affected your education and your kind of progress in that respect as well. I guess it'd just be kind of good, to, kind of good to hear your thoughts around the other side of intersectionality, I suppose, in this UK context and what that meant to you. And what, what do you, knowing what you know now about intersectionality, has it helped you kind of understand some of those push and pull forces and, and some of those, those those experiences you have, I guess, in this context, in the, in the British context? I mean, yeah, yes, definitely. I think when you live it, to, to be quite honest, I, I I knew it, I understood it, but I hid from it early okay. on. Yeah. Because I think I just found it difficult. I just, I just didn't want, because you're terrorised when you're a child and that carries on into your adulthood. So I think when I first came and did my first degree in England, I felt quite liberated because mm -hmm. again, it's a different social microcosm, <laughs> isn't it? It's sure. quite, it's international, it's uh, free thinkers, and you can have those tussle debates as well without mm. people thinking it's personal as well. Well, anyway, where I was anyway. Um, so you, and it's really, my, my first degree is in medical physics. Okay. And actually you'd think it was full of nerds but actually it's <laughs> full of free thinkers, mm -hmm. really quite full of, full of people who want to understand, who want to uh, get involved in those discussions because the science therein is quite colonial, is quite it's impacted by colonialism. So to have people in their students, I don't mean the lecturers, students yeah. that were quite free thinking and then because of that I got into uh, politics and human rights and things like mm -hmm. that because of the students that were in yeah. my course um, and there was a mixture of students so there were um, international students but also students from the UK, um, different ethnicities across the colour spectrum um, so it, it was quite liberating um, and then obviously doing that degree couldn't get a job <laughs> there was no job at the end of it um, so then I had to do a lot of volunteer work and then find my next calling which was occupational therapy okay so what what, what total, been ball, total different <laughs> ball game to like oh my gosh it made me feel othered again okay interestingly and it made me very quiet again because i felt that hyper vigilance arise again <laughs> and this is our health care <laughs> and yeah it's making me feel like this but like the topic like the therapy um and and that push, I, I wanted to speak up, but didn't speak up. So I spoke up in the in a safe way about uh, things about social disadvantage. Like mm -hmm. when I was a student, I spoke about that uh, that we had to buy our uniforms at that point. I don't think you have to now, but at that point we had to buy our uniforms. And uh, you know, saying that you know it's difficult for people who have come in on on the birth street course to then have to. Yeah use that bursary to pay for expensive okay so you know so you, did your, so, so you did your first degree in medical physics and then it, it was difficult what would have been the ideal job i guess after a degree like that in, in medical With physics, medical physics. I, 
yeah, I'm not I'm not too familiar with that with that field. Okay, so so medical what physics would have been the... all the all the equipment that is used um in, in cancer treatment and okay. radiotherapy, things like that, we would be looking after those pieces of equipment, making sure they're at the right grading of ionized uh, um, material, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So mm-hmm. um I did last one day in the job. Uh, it's 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 just boring. And when you're young, you don't want to be boring, and it is quite isolating because you're in the basement waiting for people to say, okay. "Come and help me! <laughs> Come and check this out." So, yeah, there wasn't a perfect job for me in that respect. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, it's how it's I'm grateful. How I'm grateful of me. But, yeah, no, there wasn't. Um, okay, so after the, the medical physics thing, didn't see, yeah, see you in some ways, which is absolutely, it's absolutely fine. I guess. When I first left university, I, I went to the call centre. That didn't see me. So <laughs> I, I moved on to other things, obviously. But... Um, so you did some voluntary roles and then you kind of found a way to occupational therapy. Um, and then you, interestingly, though, you said like medical physics had that free thinking, kind of that open debate, critique with different peers from across the world, with science, which is awesome. But I kind of would have expected that from an occupational therapy sort of structure, for some, just because of the nature of the work perhaps that, that you would have these free thinkers in that environment but it seems like it wasn't the case um I wonder if you could just tell firstly just ask a little bit about occupational therapy in, in kind of the educational sense just a little bit and then also about maybe a little bit more about your experience if that's okay um I've, I've lost your sound I think can you hear me <laughs> Yeah, Sorry, I'm just going to say about occupational therapy first. Uh, what yes. what it is therapy, because um, it is it is unique in the sense that it uses activities of every day as its treatment tool, mm-hmm. um, to you know uh, basically to enable people to get on with what they need and want to do for everyday living. And, and that's its uniqueness. And because it is looking at the human being, it, its um, theories are informed by many different disciplines, like mm-hmm. psychology, like um, uh, medicine, like physiology, um, cog- cognitive theories, sure. education theories. It involves a lot of different interplay of different disciplines um, for it then to be what it is, occupational therapy, using mm-hmm. activities of every day as a treatment tool. Right. And it, it does have in its core the uh, idea of um, humanism, of social justice, of inclusivity. Mm-hmm. But that is formed by the um, historical figures of the past who were people from uh, racialized as white and who okay. were part of the colonizers of the different countries. And their ideas have st- are still here in modern occupational therapy which I didn't really understand till I started doing it but I didn't voice it I started Mm. kind of um, trying to change it with one conversation one action of what I was doing as an educator and I didn't really share it with my peer and and there was no reason not to but I just was at that hyper vigilant state Sure. All the time when I come across it, conditioned to be suspicious, <laughs> you know, um, and and again, and again, once I was in the education, what was really interesting was 
in the classroom. It was a big classroom, 120 students in the classroom. Mm-hmm. And majority were people racialized as white. And there was a minority. And I just thought no one really made much notice of that. It was like that colorblind thing happening for me. And also the other thing about this intersectionality is that they see me a Asian person, female, and I'm very short. And they start treating me like I'm a child, as if I don't know. And this still happens to me now. I'm over 50 plus years old, and it's still (laughs) happening to me now, you know, that people will see me and they think, oh, and they use that tone or they'll bend over, you know, and you think, hello, (laughs) you know. And but in my fault is I keep quiet because I think it's not worth it. It's not right. worth the tussle about that aspect of it. I do tussle about other things. But <laughs> but even the education, like they're talking about social disadvantage, disability, about, you know, um, not putting your own values on the other person, everything. But it's from a Eurocentric vision. Mm-hmm. You know, and there are books that did come out trying to bring the global, the two thousand seventeen trying to bring the global aspect into it, and you know the the books are popular, getting popular, but not really being taken up. And actually, they're they're wonderful books with lots of richness about diversity about global Mm. communities and about how they are doing occupational therapy because it's not the way we're doing it here because there's I would say lots of occupational therapies depending on the cultural constant uh, context instead of one Mm. therapy but I don't think we we share that enough and I I I mean that, that the George Floyd murder really just was my you know the the straw that broke the camel's back kind of thing I just couldn't keep quiet I couldn't yeah. keep quiet. and it was my ex-student Kwaku Agaman who gave me a little platform on his podcast to talk about how I felt about the Royal College of Occupational Therapists being silent and not showing any allyship to their members racialized as BME. Sure. I let rip. <laughs> you should listen to it. You like it. I I do. I was emotional. I was emotional. Yeah. I was angry. I was emotional. And I thought, why does it keep happening? Why does it keep happening? Just because I have these characteristics. Why are these characteristics put together to oppress me? You know? Why is yeah, that it's... happening? And, yes. and I just, uh, he, he liberated me. I, I, wow. I felt, I felt he gave me that platform. And then he and I together with a couple of others formed BAMO mm-hmm. to UK because we thought there is nothing within the Royal College of Occupational Therapists. There is in the Chartered Society of Physiotherapists, but they won't do the same in the Royal College of Occupational Therapists. I find it quite bizarre. Affinity groups help to empower, change and benefit organisations, yet they didn't want to. Um, you know, I, I think there, I was speaking to my um, colleague who, who recently died, the late Dr Sally Beckwith, um, mm-hmm. and, and she was talking about how in the 70s or 80s they tried to get a LGBTQIA group together. I really tried, and that was resisted. <laughs> wow. That didn't happen, and that was in the seventies and eighties. Yeah. You know, um, so there's a real. It's a juggernaut. It's a, it, it, it definitely is a, a, a juggernaut that needs to change, and we know it's going to be slow to turn it around and change it, but it's not listening. You know, mm. compassion and authenticity is about 
being heard and that what you hear is changed into meaningful action. Yeah, so I think all so. they're doing is listening <laughs> yeah, and not it's, hearing. It's a good point. I think we're at that critical point of thinking about how do we translate how do we move from commitments and listening to a place of action and movement or mobility towards greater equality or advancing quality in some ways? I just want to put on pick just a couple of terms before we talk a little bit about, we'll learn a little bit more about the MOT as well. Um, you, you kind of mentioned the terms colorblind and, and neurocentric. And I just wondered if you could just maybe um, tell me a little bit more about what was colorblindness in the you know in that OT setting for you and what did that really mean because what I'm finding a lot is that the, the language of diversity and inclusion is changing very very quickly the the terms we're using to describe groups communities is also changing and the nuances in the language is also very different to to what it was over the years so I just wonder if you could just tell just kind of um yeah just just kind of unpick that for me in terms of in terms of color blindness and a Eurocentric part of OT? Yeah, so the color blindness that I felt in the classroom um, was the fact that they decided not to see that I was a Asian woman. That was my yeah. ethnicity. Yeah. Um, they saw that I was female, but not to see me as someone from uh, Asian ethnicity and by that time I've got this accent you know I don't yeah. have my African accent that I bought from Tanzania and mm. there was no recognition that within the classroom there were these other ethnicities we were all the same shade the same yeah. color and in that 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 is kind of an institutional racism itself because yeah. it's the the way that they 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 kind of um, put themselves together as a university as a course mm -hmm. was to uh, you know put forward color blindness as a yeah. good thing. That's interesting. Yeah. Without saying it, it was their yeah. actions. Yeah, and Eurocentric or Eurocentrism in education. This is where. Um, um, and it's a, a term really from the 1960s when they were thinking about um, how how education, again, is having a certain viewpoint, the viewpoint, what we call from the global north, from the yeah. westernized countries and communities and any translation of um, knowledge or literature from other countries is then translated into mm -hmm. this lens, this Eurocentric yeah. lens. And that's what I feel when I look at, and I didn't know the name for it until recently, but that's what I felt when I was reading the literature and thinking about the models of practice. You know, yeah. I, I understood the theories and, and principles within this sort of um, idea of the human complex of course it's multifaceted of course I understand you know when when you go and and interview that person uh, understand all the different contexts that are influencing and impacting on them I understand that but at the end all of this is, is from the lens of Eurocentrism mm -hmm. Not, not, so yeah. I'm trying to treat somebody who's from a different culture, you know, who 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 is British mm -hmm. and is not Westernized, if you like, sure. um, and really, you know, portrays and lives their ethnicity. And I'm trying to do this therapy that's all from this Western centric language and philosophy, you know. And and it was really interesting. I was talking to an uh, 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 occupational therapist from Kenya, um, mm -hmm. and he was saying that they 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 just recently got their um, colleges together for occupational therapy, and their new graduates have completed the course, and they're finding this tussle because all the education they've delivered 
is Eurocentric, is colonized. <laughs> and now they're finding this, they've got to try and figure out how to translate this for the Kenyan population, for right. the culture, for the different tribes, you know. Mm -hmm. And 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 this is what is stopping them a little. Well, it is stopping, hindering them from um, embedding occupational therapy within the country. Yeah. And he's working on that. He's already he he's dynamic guy. He's already thinking about it and and working with the the traditional medical profession, which is in itself colonized yes. <laughs> within yeah. Kenya. It works on those same uh, yeah. principles that were there from c coloniality, you know, <laughs> and, and, and so yeah. they're working with that as well. I hope I've explained that. Yeah, I understand but... it really well myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you have explained it, and you've explained it very well in the context of occupational therapy, and perhaps even the, the label of occupational therapy is embedded within some of those things, uh, those concepts you mentioned too, but I think it's just helpful to think about what kind of blindness and what Eurocentricity means um, in these different kind of professions, because I definitely think back to when I did my postgrad in clinical psychology, and it only dawned on me a couple of years ago that actually every theory and every model that I was working with or looking at was whitewashed, and I was like, oh, how on earth do I even think about this? In, the, in different cultural contexts, or even like with my own family or my own community, Asian community as well. So uh, it's really helpful to kind of um, get get clarification on the impacts of Eurocentrism in certain courses, the, the impacts of colonial education um, is rooted and suited for one community. Because, you know, and then that's, that's, that's really interesting. But well, absolutely fascinating about right. how, how, and how- it's like you go into another country, occupational therapies is not being <laughs> translated and, 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 yeah. and adapted and still being the same in that country, you know. Yeah. I, I think it's really interesting. The, the, I, I definitely will listen to your the podcast that you mentioned as well. I, I'm, I'm always, I'm always uh, looking for some, some emotional and, and empowering conversation. But um, it's interesting that you kind of raise those challenges to colleges that have the prefix of royal society or the royal label to it. And, and I think that's particularly this week has been quite an interesting kind of conversation socially and in the wider context as well. Um, I was wondering, has there been any kind of shifts in, in the Royal College of um, Occupational, is it the Royal College of Occupational Therapists? Is that is that right? Or is it the society? No, it's the royal. Don't forget the royal. They, yeah. yeah, I was a bit. I was a bit shocked when that happened. I guess I wasn't very in tune that that was happening, and then okay. when it happened, I was like, "Oh, uh, congratulations! <laughs> How did that? Oh, congratulations! <laughs> I'm not sure." And of course, yeah. my my Scottish peers were like. Oh my God, that's disgusting! I'm not paying <laughs> for my prescription. When did that happen? Mm -hmm. And it became because we weren't really in tune, so it's happened, and that's okay. nice for them. But they they don't think how it affects other people. <laughs> yeah, they just it's... not. They just do not understand the people that are at the top just do not understand and then are petrified to have the conversation openly because all I get is dead smiles and silence or they'll say oh yeah we're really interested in that we'll we'll come back to you and then it's nothing you know like and it was really strange it was like a, I tell you what I took a conversation about anti-racism do it doing some work around anti-racism and I think um Wayne Reed from uh, Basra Social Work uh, offered to give the give occupational the Royal College of Occupational Therapists a lecture on anti racism on a generic mm. level and stuff. And I said, "Oh, can I be part of that? Because I can give the occupational therapy side to it." Didn't even acknowledge me. Acknowledged Wayne. Wow. <laughs> and then some someone who had. Um, 
more Twitter presence. So then don't forget lecture and lish. And uh, then then they said, oh, email me. So I did email them. And I said, I'm not doing it for free. This is not free labor. Yeah. And uh, they said, oh, yeah, yeah, it's really exciting. Get back to you. Nothing. Not a peep. You know, and then I will be really, really very annoyed if they give Wayne something to do and not take up my offer. Yeah. I mean, I, I absolutely support Wayne. He's doing such big things in social work. But, mm -hmm. hey, I'm trying to do it for occupational therapy. Why wouldn't you come to me if I'm offering it? Yeah. <laughs> But that's the thing, you know, that that is that that's a microaggression. That's a slight towards me. And it's not mm -hmm. even hiding it. It's just like freely doing it by being silent on Twitter when I raise things. And I do raise things mm -hmm. quite forcefully because being quiet and nicey nicey isn't working. Yeah. They're not they're just keeping us, you know, at a distance all the time. And that's why BAME OT UK was formed, but even we tried to talk to them as a collective. Mm -hmm. And they're still doing the same. We said, bring us into the organization. Let us be your critical friend within the organization. Yeah. Put us in there, you know, mm -hmm. and we can look at your policies, you know, we, different eyes to look at it. Yeah. And they were like, oh, we can't do that. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Here is a group of people that really are passionate about occupational therapy, are not mm -hmm. leaving occupational therapy, but yep. just don't want this whole institutional racism recycled, recycled, recycled. We've yep. called you out. We've mm -hmm. called you out. Now do something. And you make a really good point as well, that this recycling of institutional racism. And it's also that the more it gets recycled, the more it gets embedded the more people can hide from it and you lose that accountability. Um, and I, I think that's one of the, the biggest issues, I think, that we're starting to see, which has been stunted by, you know, worldwide movements and, and wider contexts, but it is, it is an issue when you look at different institutions and some, some smaller to medium-sized institutions too. Um, so just tell, it'd be great to hear more about BAME OT UK. How did it form? What what's the yeah what's the kind of mission I guess and, and yeah, yeah well, just I, we're, learn about we're, it. yeah so BAME OT UK was sort of rapidly formed really from a point of pain mm -hmm. pain in seeing a person murdered publicly and pain in that the organisation that says it represents all its membership being completely silent and then we having to put energy in with our allies to write a letter an open letter and then being silent again and yet just to rub our noses in it liking tweets from um tweets that are racialized as white and members of um, our court who have been successful in this that and the other and we're not saying that's not great but here is a pressing issue mm -hmm. and you're dealing with trivia you yeah. know another yeah. microaggression but they don't see that anyway we finally get to talk to them and BAME OK UK BAME OT UK um, was helped by CSP BAME and by the NHS um, uh, chair of the NHS network of networks for BME people. Um, she really helped us and helped us put together our terms of reference. And we are a campaign and activist group. And we mm -hmm. want to go into those occupational therapy spaces to enable the start of change, you know, because we know this is a process. This is not an end point. This is a continuous journey that you have to, you know, as Patricia, uh, Patricia Bentick said, what did she say? Review, reframe, rebuild, the three R's, she said. You have okay. to do that continuously because it's mm -hmm. a process. You pause every time you think, oh, this is, this is feeling a bit odd again. Let's pause. 
Yeah. And review, rebuild, no, review, reframe, rebuild. And I think that's that's what they are not willing to do at all. Yeah. So that's what we, we are a collective of occupational therapy students, clinicians and edu educators racialized as BME. Uh, okay. We have a monthly meeting. It's a closed meeting. Um, some of our allies wanted to join that were racialized as white, but we said, no, this is our space. Mm -hmm. It's just our space. Sure. And from that, we've started a couple of projects. We've been able to help people um, get jobs of promotion. Um, right. We've started some uh, projects, uh, research around leadership and the broken pipeline in the career. And actually, Anita, Dr. Anita Atwell is leading yeah. on that. She's amazing. Yeah. She rattles people. She rattles <laughs> people. She's amazing. She doesn't care. She's a great disruptor. <laughs> but she's not doing it to offend. She's doing it to, yeah. to get you to sort of stop. Yeah. Stop what you're doing. Um, and uh, she has got some research money from the Elizabeth Casson Trust. Um, okay. So she's doing that leadership one and she's doing the pipeline one. And actually what her research has shown, which is really interesting and which kind of matches with what the RES data was saying, that mm -hmm. at the early stage of uh, 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 a student who's graduated, who's racialized as BME, getting that first job is much more difficult than their peers racialized as white and the res data was saying that their uh someone who's racialized as bme is less likely to get hired in comparison to their uh peers racialized as white yeah which is kind of interesting there so that that kind of explains what we are as a nutshell we are evolving as we're starting to understand ourselves Okay. Um, so we're still in an embryonic stage, if you like, because we only started June 2020, although our membership is growing. Um, but we've got to think about what's our next evolution, what's the next yes. place we're going to be at or change into. So that's where we are at the moment. We've got a YouTube channel <laughs> where we're very open about the topics we discuss, like... <laughs> Uh, we did off the bat talk about um, institutional racism okay. and we've got uh, in occupational therapy, Medicare, we're talking about occupational mm -hmm. therapy and institutional racism. Very interesting conversations I had yep. with the two people there. But we also had, uh, we've had conversations with uh, two separate podcasts. One was with black female occupational therapists because sure. they're rare. And even more rare is the black male occupational therapist. And those okay. men talked so long, I had to break the video into four parts. <laughs> I, thought, I thought they wouldn't talk, but they couldn't stop talking. They had so much to say. And it's so interesting what they had to say, actually. Yeah. You don't think about these things. You don't hear about these things. And both the black female occupational therapist and the black male occupational mm -hmm. therapist those videos are full of rich information. Yeah. So we do, um, we, we're not as regular as monthly. Sometimes we do like three okay. a month and then we have a little dead space and then we do another one, you know. But it, it's as yeah. and when topics come up, I think we, we, we try and be a bit organic and see mm -hmm. what members and allies bring to us. And then we have, then we decide on a topic. So I, I'm thinking about one with a, a couple of uh, well more than a couple of people right now in a dm group and i love the twitter um forum because it's got me into spaces and linked up with people that i never would have linked up with and yeah. would, have, would not have even felt able to even knock on their yeah. door yet i can get into their twitter feed you know? <laughs> <laughs> So that, that's been very interesting. Like you, you know, I started seeing your little tweet and I was going, oh, he's really interesting. I'm going to do that. <laughs> and then here we are. Yeah, having a conversation is great. 
<laughs> I, th- I, th- I think the Baby Z group sounds sounds fantastic. I think the fact that you're kind of constantly evolving, constantly adapting to what is needed is it's just really valuable. And being that kind of critical group that needs to hold institutions that the ones that your profession subscribe to or have to subscribe to in some ways to, to the count to, to changing and then changing with the times as well. I think um, some institutions are starting to see that if they don't invest in diversity or anti-racism, they're going to not be able to, it, I think it comes down to money talking as well. And I think that's sort of kind of <laughs> changing people's um, perspectives. So yeah. Um, I want, I want to interrupt. I want to interrupt. Yeah. Do you know what? So this kind of conversation, Bay Motor UK conversing with um, the Royal College of Occupational Therapists. So we gave them a gift. We gave them actions they could do. They didn't even think about it. We gave them the actions. Mm-hmm. They just ignored all of it, except for the one that they put in a post for a equality, diversity and inclusion officer. They didn't even have that. This is an organisation okay. that had no... EDI department and talks about social justice yeah. as its core principles. Hello. And but yeah. then they did that same thing again because they're so stuck in institutional racism. They did not think about engaging with the membership and BAMO to UK to think about the EDI strategy. They just did it themselves. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's just <laughs> That to me is like you're going back to your old ways. You're not listening again. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's yeah. so important that that yeah. Because I keep saying, you know, EDI is not anti-racism. It's for yeah. all, you know, all people within those protected characteristics to make sure they're not discriminated against. Yeah. They're not, you know, and a small part of it is anti-racism. Yeah, yeah. It's not a big noise. And it gets lost in the whole the EDI strategy. Yeah. But yeah. But, uh, yes, it's, it's a good point. It, it does get lost. It has been lost previously, which is why we're you know here today. Have seen these kind of conversations in the media, and, and even now the ones we're having too. And but just thinking about kind of being OTK, you kind of talked a little bit about specific issues, you know, and kind of intersectional thinking, and some people uh, across industries try have tried to build an intersectionality framework or a toolkit or something that they can do like a one size fits all type of approach of intersectionality and I, I kind of disagree with that personally. I, I don't think that that's something is feasible to achieve because identities are changing, <laughs> people are changing and and race equality and racism is is the story is the same structures are changing and you know I wondered how you've kind of how BAME OT or how you've kind of integrated intersectionality into thinking and into some of the activities you do sometimes. Yeah I think one of the things that we're understanding well we know is that we have got different populations different groups within our own BAMOT UK community. You can't lump us together. Mm-hmm. And that's why we had the the black female and male therapist, yeah. because they're not represented. They're not talked about, you know, mm-hmm. other than in, in data, and that's where it stays, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's interesting you talk about toolkits. And I think... It's about the leadership when it comes to toolkits because toolkits is just what it is. It's a framework, yes, mm-hmm. but it has to be contextualized to your organization. Yeah, and it's not. It's not a one size fits all, but it's also not a one stop shop, right? Yeah. You have to keep reviewing. That's where you know that that's where I get frustrated, and and I think that our BAMO T UK members get frustrated in that, you know. We're not opposed to frameworks, but don't mm-hmm. think that there's only one way to apply a framework. It's yeah. a it's a social construct. It's a theoretical construct, you know, and it should be representative of the population within organisations. But you can't be representative if you're not going and 
sharing it and, and talking to the people that it matters yeah. to, but just building your framework in isolation of those people, yeah. which a lot of the times it happens is that people design the roadmap and then come for consultation. Mm -hmm. That's not collaboration. Yeah. That That is another product of inst institutionalization that you think you have the power to decide for everybody else. Yeah. And actually, that's an easy way of dealing with it. The hard work is going around, communicating, sharing, you know, analyzing, configuring, going back, coming mm -hmm. back. They don't want to do that hard work. Because yep. that's the way you embed meaningful actions. But yep. they don't want to do that hard work. And in BAMO UK, that's what we're trying to kind of say to the Royal College of Occupational Therapists. You can't keep doing this easy, institutionalized stuff. You've got to do the hard work, mm -hmm. you know, and don't keep coming to us for <laughs> solutions. Oh. We should be working together for mm -hmm. solutions. It's not my job. To give you a solution for racism, institutional racism that you constructed in the first place. Mm -hmm. But I will work with you together because if we have the same shared purpose, yeah. then why shouldn't we work together? But they don't want to work together. They just mm -hmm. don't want to. And everyone keeps saying, we have to be slow, we have to be, you know, all the, eh, but, eh, but, eh, but, you know, <laughs> even that is institutionalized, yeah. you know, because critical yeah. race theory says, get on with it. Mm -hmm. Get on with yeah. it. Be bold in your experimentation. Trial it, review it, change it, but get on with it. <laughs> yeah. No, it's really, it's such a valuable thing to, to hear instead of, sitting on things and just creating things internally it's important to encourage openness and transparency in these things and particularly around strategies that affect <laughs> people of color ra racialized people of color um in that respect those the individuals and communities you need to engage it's, it's just kind of a given you know it's, it should be it should be kind of quite obvious as well but i guess we're still in that phase but um People think it's enough to have an EDI officer or an EDI role, and they come up with their own strategy and deliver it, um, which we do see often, um, which, is, which is quite common. But I think that, that element of participation is so so crucial. Yeah. yeah. But it's not part. Of, it's collaboration. It's collective yeah. work. It's not you know. It's not just this sort of consultative yeah. participation. It's yeah. got to be that shared experience, and that's hard work right because mm -hmm. there'll be some on the margins that don't come forward but we still need to hear their voices my student said something really interesting and, and I, it really stuck with me she said I, i'm so fed up of these um mentimeter wordle collections <laughs> you know yeah. because what you just because you see the big words because they're the people that are saying the thing the most you don't look at the little words yep. and you really should be attending to those little words the ones that don't are not big are not represented as large letters and i and i said to the child not that i do it because i'm such a techno dinosaur <laughs> but i just like talk and like write it pen and paper but um but I thought, yeah. And I said to her, why don't you say that in the classroom? Why don't you just make the person who's doing that pause? Because they yeah. need to pause. And you're the person that will enable them to pause. And she said, oh, I can't be bothered. We've tried talking before with this person and they've never listened. Yeah. And it's like, you know, it's just, they just run down. <laughs> but yeah. I know if I bring it up, to my peer, they will feel like I've just accused them of bad practice. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you don't want that. You, you want the yeah. students, because they're receiving, mm -hmm. to say, you know what, I'm receiving is not working for me. Yeah. And there's, um, I'm sure there's something around social justice and word clouds, but I think it does raise some issues that, you know, <laughs> word clouds in themselves, if they represent the majority view, then you're losing out the minority 
sends you all the melanotized bees. And if you're not, you're not getting, that's a prime example of, of inequality in a, in a word cloud in itself. So I'm, I'm sure there's a, there's an article there somewhere for wonky, maybe, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> but it's, 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 it's really interesting. And, and then also just on looking at, for example, word clouds in intersectional lens, those smaller words are not accessible to those that live with a visual impairment, for example. So again, we're, we're creating more inequalities and, and more injustice through some of these things that we might consider micro. But yeah. Oh, that is such a good point. That's such a good point. Another thing for me to take on board as well. <laughs> because, you know, uh, one of the things I got from... Uh, a tweet was someone said, I'm so glad you put BAMO T UK podcast on the YouTube channel because um, my mum my can now join in because there's like a language translator mm -hmm. on it. So the captions can be changed into different languages, okay. you know, and, and she's partially hearing. So she's got captions on right. there. So it, it, it kind of gives lots of different ways of trying to hear what is being said in the video mm -hmm. and at, I just thought oh it's got captions that's really good but I didn't think of all the translations and things like that that help people yep. as well yep. so that was really interesting about you know not marginalizing people who do have disabilities and they want to watch your video as well so you make a very good point there there's always um another another lens i think that's the it's a good example of, i guess that intersectional thinking in some ways and applying it to everything i think kimby quenshaw talks about it as a metaphor as a way of looking at things right and i think that's something we always have to keep that keep at heart um just thinking we've been talking for a while about Intersectionality, this is clear that it's been part of your journey from Tanzania through to Bame AT UK, which I just think is incredible. Um, and how it's integrated, or well, integrated, I don't think that's a word, but integrated into your practice, your, your personal life as well, your experiences, and also the ways in which you perform activism and calling those things out, I think is really incredible. I guess it would be good just to kind of get, if you have any kind of final thoughts or any particular take home messages around intersectional thinking, practice, the way, or in relation to OT, or just yourself more broadly as well. So, um, yeah, just wanted to be any kind of take home messages. Oh, yes, I have <laughs> more. I have more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, one of the things is I always get upset about buzzwords, and I'm always scared that these really important words like race equality and intersectionality will become these empty shell buzzwords and then mm -hmm. you know and platitudes and no actions and and just a feel good thing you know and I really have to even myself I call myself an activist now because mm -hmm. it's to push me to action instead of saying I've seen that I'm really annoyed about it mm -hmm. I'll just do a little tweet you know and yeah. that will be it. I don't want to just be there. What what Twitter has done for me and, and, and sort of meeting up with people like yourselves, it's given me that activist. I want to be active. And I think we need to be active yeah. about this. You know, this is about the, 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 the start of embedding sustainable change, you know. Mm -hmm. Because I'm sorry to say it's going to be another generation, you know, we will be soil, we will be fodder for the worms before, I'm sorry, you're so young, but it is going <laughs> to happen, but you know, yeah. it's going to happen. But uh, before any great movement happens in society, mm -hmm. yes, and we've got to kind of get a collective going, we've got to get a collective going yeah. so that we can enable this change to occur at some point in the future but yeah. I want to start seeing the process happening and I'm mm -hmm. not seeing that process happening yeah. within the Royal College of Occupational Therapists I yeah. am seeing it in in other allied health professions okay. um, 
like physiotherapy a little bit, I think, uh, although maybe some of the speech and language therapists may disagree with me, but I think they are having a bit of a forward movement. Mm -hmm. But it, it's that whole thing about creating safety for this change to happen. If, and, and I'm feeling it right now in my organisation because of my new role, that I'm still coming up where my hypervigilance is coming up because I go into a meeting, it's full of people racialized as white, and I'm trying to defend a point that is just a civil thing to do, just a good yeah. thing to do, just a nice, even a nice thing sure. to do. And I'm having to defend that point to people who are mm -hmm. in a high position, in a private position, and do not want to change because yeah. it will mean they will they will have to lose some of their privilege. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. they don't want to do it. And the most important thing for me is if we're going to use intersectionality, use racial race equality as a tool for good we've got mm -hmm. to get the foundations uncorrupted because you can't make this change on corrupted foundations because it will yep. suck it away and it will just disappear so mm -hmm. we need from board to front line we need changes happening lots of activities happening at the same time and yeah. the leaders and the leaders at the top and the boards at the top have to do their anti-racism training annually, have to show that this is a permanent agenda item in no. the meetings, have to show that the strategies that they're putting forward has got this in it mm -hmm. all the time. Without that, anything you and I do is in vain, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because we need those people in power with the privilege to make the change to come on board and be part of the collective. Yep. And that is never going to happen if, you know, we, we are never going to create sustainable change without them on board. And yep. we have to uplift, uplift everybody, uplift everybody through equitable policies, practices, processes, and make those positive actions and not see it as yep. something something from a deficit model, but see it as an uplift about values-based, strength-based working. I mean, we don't do that enough visibly at mm -hmm. all in organisations. Um, and I think that kind of... I'm so passionate about it. It kind of <laughs> sums up for me that you need it from board to front line and you need collaborations, you need collective activities happening yep. at every level of the organisation, not yep. to wait for one, then do another one. You know, just keep those strands of activity happening and at some points they'll meet and they'll become another collaborative. Some points they'll clash and you pause and you rethink, but mm -hmm. you keep going forward. Yep. Bold experimentation. I love that. That's su such an insightful and empowering way to, to end this call as well. <laughs> and this, this conversation, I, there's not really much more than that, but just to say thank you so much for your time and telling us your story and about your experiences and, and some of the great activism work you're doing. And we'll make sure that links to your networks and series and things are all below 